Bibles, please. I left my notes in the office. I think it's the book of Matthew what we're doing. Matthew chapter 5, verse 48. Matthew 5, 48. The Bible says, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. And let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word, uh, for giving it to us without error and preserving it that way. And I pray that tonight you would help us as we study it. I pray your Holy Spirit would speak to us and give us understanding. And uh, Lord, I pray that uh, you would help us uh, not just to learn from it, but to apply what we learn to our lives. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to talk about uh, <clears throat> the aspect of the Christian life uh, regarding balance, proper balance. And... Um, the word perfect here that we find mentioned twice in verse 48, it's not a, we're not being commanded to a, a achieve or attain a sinless perfection. Uh, that's not, uh, that's not what that word means in this context. It's, it's a word that we would use in describing a baby when they're born. When babies are born, they, if they're born in the hospital or sometimes a, a, a midwife will administer the same test that they they get tested right away and it's almost like I didn't know there's going to be a test but they, they call it the APGAR test and they they test uh, certain things they look for certain things they count the number of fingers and the number of toes and how many ears and how many nostrils and and um, uh, I think the nurse when Jared was born said that uh, in order to score a 10 on that test I think they go up to 10 whatever the highest number is, they said, she said they pretty much have to come out quoting Shakespeare to score that highest, uh, highest number. And, and, and so they, they count all these things, and they say, your baby's perfect. Well, we know, we know for certain that nobody in this world is perfect. That was Jesus, and he ascended into heaven already. And what they're referring to is not a sinless condition of that baby. They're referring to it being complete. Everything's there that's supposed to be there. It's got eyes and ears and nose and mouth and fingers and toes and hands and arms and legs and and they check to see how how everything bends and they move the, the legs and knees and everything all around and uh, make sure that they're not dislocated. All, all manner of things that they test for and they say that's a perfect baby. Uh, even if it didn't score the perfect score, uh, they'll say it's it's a complete, it's, it's there, everything's there. Uh, so the word perfect here means having all the facets, or it also means being balanced. Being balanced. And so what the Bible is telling us is that we should have, we should strive, and we should work towards, uh, our goal should be to have all the facets of Christianity in our life, but it's also telling us that we should have them in balance. There, there should be a, a, a proper proportion of them. Um, the fact of the matter is, life, and especially the Christian life, is a series of corrections. The thing about corrections is every correction brings the potential of causing another mistake. If we go too far, my dad told me that uh, you can take any doctrine to an extreme and it can become a heresy when you do so. And, and that's, uh, uh, that's very much the, the truth. It's like driving a car. When you're driving a car, there's constant corrections. When you first learn how to drive a car, you, you find that it, it, it starts to go off to the right a little bit, so you turn the steering wheel to the left, and, 
And then, oh, no, you, now you're going too far to the left, so you turn it back to the right. Now you're going too far. And it's like you're, you're swerving all the way down the road. The more you practice and the better you get at it, the, the more you're able to drive in what looks like a straight line. The fact is, there's still the uh, corrections going on all the time. They're just, they just happen to be smaller corrections and maybe not have to be done as often, but they still have to be done. And our, the roads that we drive on, the streets, everything, are not perfectly straight either. So we have to adjust to, to that. Now, uh, God's way is straight and it's always correct, but uh, and since we are imperfect and we're trying to walk a perfect path, we're going to have to make corrections. We're not going to we're not going to end up perfectly straight. But as we practice and as we <clears throat> as we work on it, we can get better at it. And that should be that should be our that should be what we're striving to do. That should be our goal. Is is uh, okay? Instead of saying, "Well, I'm not going to I'm not going to ever achieve sinless perfection this side of glory. I'm just going to give up and 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 go to no." We should be striving to improve. The Bible commands us to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We're commanded to continue to grow and grow and grow. So, okay, that'd be like saying to a child that you're trying to get them to learn how to walk, and they take two steps, and then they sit down, and then say, well, you know what, I guess they're never going to get it. There's no sense in, in working with them anymore. That'd be ridiculous. None of us would be walking today if that had been the case. And so the fact is, Parents continue to work, or grandparents, or somebody continues to work with that child, and the child learns how to walk, uh, albeit somewhat wobbly, and, and maybe not in an exact straight line, and maybe they trip and fall from time to time, and so we teach them how to get back up after they have fallen, and then continue again, and as they practice more and more, they get better at going in a straight line, and get better and better and better. Um, I was thinking about... Uh, uh, when, when I was a kid and walking along the railroad tracks and you get up on the on the railroad track and and uh, kids don't try this at home everything's different now uh, than it used to be uh, but uh, I think the next generation will be wearing helmets in the back seat of a car with uh, enclosed in a car seat uh, wrapped up to their neck in bubble wrap uh, but uh, my generation grew up a little bit differently walking back and forth on the back seat of the car as it's going down the road 50 or 60 miles an hour. And, and uh, um, anyways, uh, uh, so walking down the road tracks and I start to lean off to the right and I'd have to correct and, and then I start to lean off to the left and I'd have to correct again. And, and then I'd watch the Olympics and I'd watch these people get up on this balance beam which is about as narrow as a railroad track and they just run from one end to the other do flips and somersaults on it, do a backward roll and come up and, and stand on their hands on it. And I thought, wow. And, and I struggle to go on, on a railroad track that's, that's right on the ground, let alone three or four feet up in the air off of the ground. And I don't think I would dare to even try a, a, a somersault on the thing, much less a handstand or, or a flip on it. How did they get to that point? And the difference is they had a coach and they had practice practice, 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 and hours and hours and hours of learning. And so are they still making corrections as they, as they move from one end of that balance beam to the other? Yes. But their corrections are not as obvious and they're not as drastic as when they first started doing it. And it was just, uh, they were just learning how to do it. And so the same thing with the Christian life. Our correction is, is perhaps going to be a little bit awkward at first. And we'll go in one direction and then find out, you know what, I, I'm, I'm going too far in this direction. I need to make a correction and go back in the other direction. And, oh, I've gone too far. And, and the more we practice and the more we, we work at it, the better we'll get at going in, in a, more of a straight line. Balance is so very, very important. And being keenly aware of what direction we're going and what we're trying to accomplish is very important because otherwise we won't know where corrections need to be made. There's, there's several areas where God wants us uh, to have balance, where he emphasizes it. First of all, let me say this. God wants us to have balance in grace and truth. Grace and truth. So many of the epistles 
uh, start out with that greeting, grace and truth to you, or sometimes they'll say mercy and grace. Uh, but, uh, but grace and truth need to be balanced. If you get too far off and, and all you have is grace, you'll go liberal. And yet if, uh, uh, if you focus all your time and attention and, and energy on, on the truth, then you can become so strict that nobody wants to be around you. And so you, you end up and in, in you're, you're being gracious and gracious and gracious and, and then at the expense of truth and then you end up as a, as a compromiser or you end up going the other direction and everything's truth and everything's truth and everything's truth and you have no grace, then, then it's a, a very strict and a very, uh, people start calling you a, a legalist and, and they just really don't want to be around somebody. Uh, and, and you come across as thinking you're more perfect than anybody else and that's certainly not the truth. So God wants us to have balance in grace and truth. God wants us to turn with me to the book of Mark, chapter 6. Mark chapter 6. God wants us to have balance in justice and mercy. Justice and mercy. Mark chapter 6, verse 8 says, and let's, uh, let's go to verse 7. And he called unto him the twelve, and began to send them forth by two and two, and gave them power over unclean spirits, and commanded them that they should take nothing for their journey. something down wrong. Check one other thing. I will look that up and have it Sunday morning. But justice and mercy, it's its sometimes easy to be strong on justice. And then we neglect mercy. And so then we, we say, oh, I, I need to make that correction. I need to be more merciful. And then we end up sacrificing justice. And so we end up correcting back. And it's important to strike a, a good balance uh, and not be too lenient and not be too strict and not be, uh, I, I know a, a, a fellow that had a, uh, he had a paddle on one side, it was, it was wood, and on the other side, it was padded. And I've, I've seen some of these, and uh, I've seen them that are padded on both sides, and that's called Grandpa's paddle. Uh, but uh, uh, on one side it was, and so one side he had that strict justice, and then other times there was some mercy involved. He flipped it over and, and used the padded side. Um, but it's a, it's a constant correction. And as I, I've said, the more that you practice, and the more that we, that we focus and, and start paying attention to this, and living the Christian life on purpose and not haphazardly and not by accident, uh, but we say, okay, today I, I need to be purposeful in this area. I need to be purposeful in the things, and, and I need to live my life. Uh, I need to bring it under control so I can yield that control to the Holy Spirit of God. Uh, the more you practice, the closer you come to staying on that line. Somebody once, they put it this way, uh, an old, older pastor from the older generation uh, counseled me this way. He said, preach as hard as you can from the pulpit and then when you come down off the platform, love as hard as you can from there. And what he was saying there, there's a balance that needs to be had. And there's a, uh, I, I, I cannot compromise what the Bible says uh, by, by way of its truth and by way of justice and, and, and yet the Bible also ta uh, tells us to be merciful, and so there has to be mercy within my life. I have to demonstrate mercy, and, and so it, it may seem like, man, you're trying to kill everybody with the Bible, uh, and maybe, th maybe that from the pulpit, and I don't want to kill it, you know, uh, I want to help people, and I think the only way we're helped is by way of the truth, but then I also want everybody to realize I'm not condemning anybody. 
if, if you don't live the way the Bible says, that just means you're human. But we should be trying, we should be striving, we should be improving. And so there's 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 times when when I see people and I know they're not they're not living according to to the Bible, they're not living to the standards that are in the Bible. What should I do when I see them at the grocery store? I should be kind to them. I should be kind to them. I, I should I should think about well, how would I like to be treated by when, when, when I was found to be imperfect, well, I sure would appreciate some mercy. And, and I think when, when we have, when we do this, we have an opportunity to show God, God, this is how I want to be treated when I'm found to be imperfect. I, I would like some mercy. Uh, when, I, when I fail to match your justice, when, when you say, here's the line, and I'm supposed to walk on that line, and I fail, and I fall off, or I, 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 go, I'm, I go after my own way, and so I'm, I've gone astray, how do I, I, I would like some mercy in that case. When it comes time to, to face trial, I sure would like some mercy. And so God gives us these opportunities to show him how we would like to be treated. That's why he says, I want you to forgive others the way you want to be forgiven. So when somebody does you wrong, God says, that's an opportunity for you to show me how, you, how do you want to be forgiven? Uh, somebody's done you wrong. Show me how you want to be forgiven. And okay, God, here's how I want to be forgiven. I'm going to forgive them. That's how I want to be forgiven. Uh, next, number three. God wants us to have balance in the area of honor and majesty. Now let me see if I wrote this reference down right. Psalm 96, verse 6. It says this, Honor and majesty are before Him. Strength and beauty are in His sanctuary. So honor and majesty. Honor and majesty. Sometimes I've, I've seen, I've seen, I had the privilege of, of traveling with my dad to visit, I, I don't know, I never bothered to count, but I imagine it was hundreds of churches. I know we put over 100,000 miles on a car within a year's time, and and there were some times when we came back, we visited new churches, and other churches had uh, uh, decided to, to cease supporting him, or, or some churches just fizzled out and weren't there anymore, and we didn't visit them because they weren't there. And so we'd visit new churches and, and try to make up for the lost support, and, and sometimes there was a special need, and he was trying to raise a little bit of extra support. And I got to see many churches. And sometimes, sometimes you'd walk into a church, and boy, this was a big time church. I mean, it was fancy, and and the, the even the parking lot was fancy, and it had designated parking for different people in the church. Here's where the pianist parks, and here's where the secretary parks, and and oh, right here the very special parking spot. That's the pastor's parking spot, and 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 it's up close, and it's the preeminent parking spot in the whole place. And and then you'd walk in. And it was almost like the pastor felt he had been crowned pastor. And didn't have time for the little people. And uh, thank God those weren't the majority of churches we, we were in. But every once in a while, there, there'd be one. And it was in the... Uh, uh, I didn't think much of it. I was a kid and I was used to being brushed off. Beat it, kid. You're bugging me. Type thing. And 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 uh, uh, so I, I didn't really I didn't really pay much note or, or, or anything else. But but there's got to be a balance there. And it's important for for pastors to realize that the altar call is just as much for the preacher as it is for anyone else. And I've said this before, one of the benefits that I have is, is in preparing the sermon, I get to, I get to spend some time uh, at, with my own altar call before I ever preach the sermon. But the altar call is just as much for, for the preacher as it is for anyone else. And, and so uh, sometimes it gets thinking about the, the majesty that that office holds and, and, and yet for getting to honor other people as well. Um, Parents so often strive to be friends to their kids. And, and I don't think it's necessarily wrong for a parent and their child to be a friend, but that should not be the goal. 
the, and, and it should never be done at the expense of the parent being a parent to the kid uh, and to, the, to their son or to their daughter. And I think that if they will parent properly, that friendship uh, has a better chance of flourishing there than if they, if they decided, I'm not going to be a parent at all, I just want to be a pal. Uh, I just want to be a friend and spend all my time and energy and focus on just being their buddy and and then I'm never going to parent them and I think that's a that's an improper balance. I think you're better off by focusing on what God would have you to focus on and and the the opportunity for friendship is increased a, a true and lasting friendship uh, is what I'm talking about not something that looks like friendship uh, but truly is not John her Majesty Strength and beauty, right here in the same same verse, uh, Psalm 96, 6. Uh, honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. That's not something that we often consider to be the same thing. Sometimes we think of things that are strong, and, well, usually those things aren't necessarily pretty. And then we think of things that are pretty, and we think of well, that's a more delicate. We don't think of we don't think of strength. And yet God says, here's where where you ought to have a balance. Here's where you should have a balance. Uh, somebody somebody told me that it uh, it demonstrates. True strength is not demonstrated by destroying somebody. True strength is demonstrated by having the power to destroy somebody and not using it, refraining from using that power. The refraining takes more strength than it does to unleash it. Uh, <clears throat> so that, that, that strength. Um, strength and beauty. Sometimes we, we talk about, uh, the Bible talks about, about treating the woman as a weaker vessel. Not It doesn't call her a weaker vessel, but it says that, that men should treat her as though she were. And, and I, I find a whole lot of strength kind of hidden away in, in, in the beauty of motherhood. And, and the, the position of wife. There's a whole lot of strength there that's not necessarily seen. It's, it's tucked away and it's hidden. Uh, just just the, to, to run a house right takes a lot of strength. It takes a lot of energy. It takes a lot of what my dad used to call stick to itiveness. And just to keep going and keep going and keep going and, and, and keep things right and keep things... It, and boy, sometimes it's an uphill battle, and sometimes the boundaries are tested, and, and then the boundaries are left alone for a year or two or three years, and then they're tested again, and then, and then you think, well, I thought you knew that already. Now we, gotta, we, we need to sit down and, and show you there, this fence is still here. These boundaries, and that takes some strength. Uh, let's, let's look at the, uh, the very next chapter, Psalm 97 and verse 10. Let's move on to the next one. Ye that love the Lord, Hate evil. So love and hate should be balanced. You can't have one without the other. You can't, you can't have true love without having hate. If you are going to love the Lord, you're going to have to hate evil. You have to hate. So you can't love right without hating sin, without hating wrong. And so you can't love righteousness, you can't love right living without developing a hate for wrong living. Now, it's not a hatred towards people, it's a hatred towards a, a, a thought process, a philosophy, a, a concept, an idea, the iniquity of it. And, and now, those that are evil, those that, that are evil, well, you know what? Evil is a sin that's done with the intent of hurting somebody. And that's it's a, it's a purposeful, planned harming of somebody. That's evil. And the Bible says we're supposed to hate that concept. We're supposed to hate anything that's, that's involved with that. Uh, hey, if you, want to, if you want to hurt somebody, I don't want to be a part of that at all. 
I, I hate that altogether. I don't necessarily hate the person, but I hate the, the plan that they have. That's evil. And you're not going to be able to love God. You, you, you can't say, well, I love the Lord, but I love sin too. That's, that's just not right. The Bible says the truth is not in us if we say that. Uh, and so, uh, a love and a hate. You, you, can't, uh, you can't say you love your children and then let them play with rattlesnakes. You have to hate the danger that, that would come to them. You have to hate the things that would harm them, that would damage them, and guard against those things, and, and protect them against those things. Love and hate should be... We can't go around hating everything. We can't be filled with hatred. But yet we cannot compromise our love for God without... And say, well, I'm just going to love anybody and everybody and everything. Now, we, should, we are commanded to love one another. We're commanded to love the lost. But we don't have to love what they're doing. We don't have to love what they're involved in. We don't have to love what their plans are. We should want them to get saved. So, several years ago, somebody, uh, uh, well, they, the, the media got all upset because they said, they said, I hope this president is not successful. <laughs> and they said, oh, you shouldn't say that. You shouldn't wish him ill. He said, I didn't wish him ill. I wished his plans ill. Because the, the, the president, I think at the time, he was wanting this uh, uh, creative grading. Let the kids issue their own grades. And, and just, uh, hey, if you think you deserved an A, mark it down as an A. And you can do that all through school. And you can graduate high school with a 4.0 grade average. And you have all A's. And, and, uh, but you're dumber than a box of rocks. You know what? That's a, that's a, that's a wrong mentality. And, and I would hope anybody trying to pass that would fail at that endeavor. <clears throat> so you can't say, well, I just, I just love and I hope they're successful in all that they try to do. No, if they're trying to hurt some things, if they have some bad ideas, and if what they're trying to do is to harm somebody, I hope they fail at that. I hope they're not successful at it. I hope they're successful at getting saved and getting right with God. I hope they're successful at that. But I hope that, the, that they don't succeed in the plans that they have that would harm other people. Number six, and we'll finish here. Turn with me to Romans chapter 10 and verse 1. Romans 10, 1 says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. But the righteousness which is of faith, speaketh on this wise. Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven? That is, to bring Christ down from above. Or, who shall descend into the deep? That is, to bring up Christ again from the dead. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth, and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Now, let's go back here to the first, first three verses of this passage here. Uh, <clears throat> verse 3 specifically says, For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Now, they're ignorant, is what he says. He said, but... Verse 2, I bear them record that they have a zeal of God. Zeal and knowledge should have a balance. There should be a balance there. He said, well, they, they have a zeal for God. They have a, a sincerity, and that sincerity gives them an energy. And boy, they, they're, they're very sincere. They're very zealous for God. But 
They're ignorant. They don't know about God. They don't know about the Messiah. They don't know about Christ. They don't know about the Savior. There's questions about who's going to go up to heaven and bring the Savior down, or who's going to go down to the depth and hell and bring him up from the grave. Uh, and and he, he said, uh, uh, it's not about that. It's about faith. They don't understand what the law is about. The Bible tells us the law was not in the intention of the law was not to save anybody. The intention of the law was to show us that we're sinners and can't save ourselves, that we're in need of a savior. But boy, they had a zeal for God. The the is the Jewish people, the the children of Israel. They viewed themselves as God's special people, and they were. They were God's chosen people, and they had a zeal for God, and they, they felt honored because of that, as well they should have. But then they lost somehow the knowledge that they should have had. And I know a lot of Christians that have a, they have a lot of zeal, but they don't really have a lot of knowledge. And, and that, that can harm the cause of Christ. I mean, there's some who say, yep, the King James Bible, just like the one Paul read from. Um, you do realize that Paul lived before the 1600s, right? <laughs> so if you're talking about a 1611 King James Bible, he didn't have one. And as far as I know, Paul didn't speak English. And if he did speak English, it wouldn't have been the English that, that any of us would recognize today. Even the, not just the words that they chose, but the way they wrote. I can't tell the difference between an S and an F in, in uh, the way they wrote four or five hundred years ago. They look the same to me. Or do they look the fame to me? One of those two. Uh, and I think I can tell the difference now. But, I mean, they make statements like that. And... And I'll say that from time to time, just tongue-in-cheek, knowing that, I, I, at least I'm hoping that y'all know, that I know that Paul didn't read from the King James Bible. But I think if Paul, uh, in fact, I know that if Paul lived amongst us today and in this country and was, was preaching to English-speaking people, he would use the King James Bible. He would find it to be a better uh, translation because that's what it is, is a translation. If somebody else came up with a translation, it might rival, but I don't think so. All they've been able to come up with is versions. And the Bible says, he, he said here, where the Jews, they've got a good zeal, but they don't have the knowledge. They don't have the knowledge. And so someone comes along with, with, with a question and they say, well, I don't know. That's a good question. And it, it, it can shake their faith, and it does nothing to convert those that are wrong. Turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 3. First Peter chapter 3. The Bible says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you, with meekness and fear. Now, I don't believe that means we have to be an expert on everything. We do need to be knowledgeable on that which is right. That which, and, and I've, I've spent a lot of time on doctrine, and now, Lord willing, continue to spend a lot of time on doctrine. I, I think that uh, churches worth their salt spend time on doctrine. And it's important for us to know what we believe and have a Bible reason for believing it. I've, I've said this so often, it's not good enough for, for church members to say, well, that's just what our church preaches. That's not good enough. That I, I don't want that to ever be the final answer. Now, if somebody just got saved and they, they haven't been saved over a year, I guess that might that might go. But if you've been saved over a year and, and you're still giving that answer on some of the basic things, then there's a problem. There's a problem. You might have a good zeal, but you also need to you also need to be growing in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I think it's important for us to have 
and, and I have a few passages that I'll, if somebody says, well, uh, what do you think about this version of the Bible? I've got a very brief answer that I give. I have about two or three verses that I'll show them. If they're not convinced by those verses, because what those verses show is that the, the perversions of the Bible call Jesus Satan, or they call Satan Jesus, depending which way you look at it, either way, I mean, basically they're calling Jesus Satan, and if that's not enough to convince them that there's something very wrong with the Bible they're wanting to use, then there's nothing that I'm going to be able to say that will convince them. And so I take them to those passages. Hey, if you want a Bible that calls Jesus Satan or calls Satan Jesus, then that's what you have. But I want one that makes a clear distinction between the Son of God and the Father of lies. And that's the one I have. See, my Bible tells me that Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. Their Bible says that He was cast out of heaven. And refers to, it doesn't use the word Lucifer, it uses a, a name for Jesus. And so it takes Satan's name out and puts Jesus' name in there in his place, in the only place in the Bible, in Isaiah chapter 14, that uh, the name Lucifer occurs and they wipe it out completely. If that's not enough, then I don't think there's anything that I could show them that would be enough. Uh, but I, I have I have some where I can say, this is why I use the King James. This is why I believe that. If you believe in the virgin birth, you ought to stick with the King James because the other ones take out the word virgin and they just put a young maiden. And so on the King James issue, I have that. Uh, there, there's, we ought to have enough knowledge about science. And I'm not saying we, we all need to become experts on geology and biology and everything else, but, but there's a few things that you, can, that you can know, that you can learn, and you say, oh, okay, I know for a fact that there's just as much evidence for a young earth. In fact, there's more evidence for a young earth than there is for this billions and billions of years we will see. There just is. They have to make stuff up to explain the holes in, in, their, in their belief system. They just have to make it up. But they accuse us of having faith. And I've said this before, and, and I'll say it again because it's still true. It takes faith either way. If you're going to be an atheist, that takes faith. You're having to believe in something that you have not personally seen. You're exercising faith. It takes faith to be a Christian. It just does. Our faith has more evidence to back it up than their faith. If you just let the evidence stand and speak for itself without having to twist it or modify it or change it, there's more to back up what the Bible tells us to be true. Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed. See, the workman part, that's the zeal. The study part, that's the knowledge. God wants us to have balance here in our lives. Not all zeal, not all knowledge and no zeal, but a balance between the two. A balance of knowing the Bible and going out and telling the lost about it. Let's stand tonight and we'll close.